It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. In this episode, we continue our special series, Aftermath of the Endless War, Reckoning with Iraq and Afghanistan. The American military response to the 9-11 attacks started with earnest promises, beginning just days after the destruction of the World Trade Center by President George W. Bush, that the U.S. response would not be a war on Islam, was not a clash of civilizations, would be a fight only against terrorists and terror itself. Yet more than a decade later, and after at least 200,000 deaths of soldiers and civilians, more than two-thirds of Americans, say they hold somewhat negative prejudices against Islam. And many prominent political and media figures today say it's time to admit openly that the West is at war with what they call radical Islam and believe to be a fundamentally primitive and evil faith incompatible with modern Western ideals. Brutal acts in recent weeks by the group calling itself the Islamic State, including the attack on Charlie Hebdo in Paris, the beheadings of innocent Japanese, British, and American civilians, and a gruesome video of a captured Jordanian pilot being burned alive have further hardened these views of Islam as a savage faith. Our guests today are prominent voices in the intellectual debate around the modern state of Islam. John Owen is a professor of politics at the University of Virginia and the author of Confronting Political Islam, Six Lessons from the West's Past. Also joining us is Ahmed Al-Rahim, a professor of religious studies who focuses on the medieval traditions of Islamic civilizations and their implications in the modern world. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. These are difficult times to talk about, uh, to talk about Islam and what is Islam and the relationship between Islam and the West, and yet, but a time at which maybe it's never been more important to try to get to the bottom of these things that Americans have been have been wrestling with all through all of this time. But John, let's start with you. You've written this very sophisticated book uh, that draws out not exactly parallels, but lessons of history and comparisons, I think, between the evolution of Christianity and Western societies and Islam and Islamic societies and countries and the sorts of things that we have seen recently the burning of this Jordanian pilot in particular, some of the other brutalities that have occurred, are things that have echoes in the history of Christianity. It's not that unlike the Puritans who were burning witches or the Romanians who were, who were executing vampires uh, in medieval times. I mean, there, there is this history of, the, of these things. But what should Americans conclude in 2015 uh, uh, that would say that Islam is not a savage faith? I would start by taking the broad view of history, even broader than I take in the book, and, and look at Islam from its origins 1,300, 1,400 years ago. And if you map that out, you see that Islam varies both in, in, in practice and its connection to politics widely across time and space. Islam, in, in my view, is going through a, a period in which there's heavy polarization, arguments, lots at stake uh, over the way Islam and Muslims ought to conduct themselves and organize their societies in the modern world. The, in the West, we have been through similar periods. We're not really going through one now, but if uh, the Cold War is one such period, going back into the 19th century, monarchists and Republicans argued and killed and died uh, over which was the better regime type, and going back to what you've already alluded to, Catholics and Protestants also fought and died, uh, did some pretty awful things four or five hundred years ago. Those periods, thankfully, are over, and I think, but, but again, the, the way to look at this is it's a, it's a rough patch of many decades. This is not to downplay it. It's quite serious. We can't wish it away, but it's not to be confused with the religion of Islam itself any more than uh, some of the atrocities and wars of 500 years ago in Europe should be confused with Catholicism or Calvinism or Lutheranism. 
Ahmed, you, you call yourself a medievalist, I mean, in terms of your, your specialty and your focus on these things. The, what's your take on the, the idea that, that there's something that positions modernism differently if we, if we make this comparison to centuries ago, the way Christianity was evolving? But doesn't that in some way also underscore the idea that current day Islam is medieval in a sense, if we're sort of drawing comparisons to medieval era Christianity? I mean, the problem with the, the premise of the question is that uh, it assumes that we can talk in the singular about Islam and we can talk in the singular about the Islamic world and the 1.3 billion Muslims. Uh, uh, and so I don't think we use that kind of language in referring to other religious communities. We know we do not talk about a policy towards uh, uh, the Hindu world or a, a policy towards the Jewish world. And so uh, that problem of reifying Islam, I think, is really at the heart of uh, some of the policy problems. Uh, and so in thinking about Islam in the modern world, well, we have to begin thinking about the invasion of Egypt with Napoleon in 1798 and how the medieval period is refracted, and in the case of political Islam, through the lens of ideology. Uh, so I think uh, uh, John's book is really helpful in situating the question of ideology. And so, so I think I would place uh, the, the, the issue of political Islam as an ideological one in, in the present and not necessarily talk about sort of Muslims, uh, you know, qua Muslims in general. Yeah. I think we also have to kind of start with where American perceptions are today, sure. you know, in this really conflicted set of views, particularly given, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, that uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there were really a surprisingly significant number of voices in American life who were saying, hey, let's be careful that this doesn't become construed as a war on Islam. And the folks who were behaving that way in the, some of the attacks that occurred domestically uh, on, is on Muslims at the time were generally viewed very negatively. I mean, things that President Bush was saying at the time, very clearly, six days after the attack, the face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. Uh, three days later, the terrorists are traitors to their own faith. A week after that, Americans understand we fight not a religion. Ours is not a campaign against the Muslim faith. Uh, a month after that, ours is a war against individuals who absolutely hate what America stands for and hate freedom. And then just after that, uh, in, a, in a Ramadan message, and President Bush gave very eloquent Ramadan messages repeatedly, the word, he referred to Islam as the worship of one God as revealed for the Holy Quran teaches the value and importance of charity, mercy, and peace. I mean, there really was a big, bold yeah. assertion uh, of, a, of a very open-minded approach to Islam. And the, yet that is not what most Americans uh, actively view. That's not the way that we view Islam or even the variations of Islam today. At least that's my perception. Uh, but so how do, we, how do we take these historical lessons that are a little complicated uh, and change that what is it that Americans mm. should most attach to in the analysis that you bring to the table to help them better understand the contemporary issues between the West and Islam? Well, I'll start with uh, lesson one. This is a book of le six lessons, and I call this Don't Sell Islamism Short, by which I mean don't underestimate it, uh, its longevity, its severity, its uh, reach, which is now nearly global. Uh, we can learn from the history of the West's own ideological conflict in the following way. I, I think Americans are tired, not just Americans, everybody's tired of this, and probably surprised that and, and dejected that interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan went so badly, and that if anything, there's more savagery than before. Nothing on the scale of 9-11, but these attacks are repeated, and so I'm guessing the average American's thinking, well, all, the only answer we have left is it must be the religion itself. Mm -hmm. It's not because we tried all the things we normally do, money, war, rhetoric, diplomacy. Uh, but history teaches that ideological conflicts can go on for a long time and that military interventions in particular don't end them. They actually can aggravate them, can make them worse. So um, one example from history is uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, 1917, 1918. Lots of people in the West thought this is a radical movement. It can't last because it uh, destroys capitalism, it destroys business. Um, this is a sort of revolution that will eat its own young. And so we have to combat it, but we can just wait it out. It will self-destruct. 
Ultimately, it did self-destruct, but that took several decades. 1989-90 uh, is when it happened. In the meanwhile, it went on and on. And in fact, in the 50s, lots of smart people in the West thought communism was going to win the Cold War. So uh, that's instructive to us now. Don't think that, uh, don't get confused about what's really going on. It is an ideological conflict. That doesn't mean we can solve it easily or that it's going to die off anytime soon. And instructive too in that case that the Russian Orthodox Church has now come back as powerfully as, um, perhaps as powerfully as it was the time of the revolution. And yep. the revolution that was against that particular faith. Indeed. Uh, yeah. Well, but, but so, but, uh, Ahmed, what's your, what about you? What do you, what is the, I really want to wrestle for a few minutes with this, that, uh, that all the evidence that's immediately available for Americans as they try to understand this conflict without necessarily reading a book like this, uh, is that this is a group of folks who have not reformed, they may have diversified, but that, who, and contrary to the sorts of things President Bush said, there's lots of polling from, the, from particularly the Middle East that says that while lots of, of believers in the faith of many, of, of both Sunni and Shia, uh, while they may criticize the severity of some of the things that have happened or the brutality of things, they may even say 9-11 is problematic, but then they're very likely in polls to turn around and say, but it was time for America to learn a lesson, and, or they may express some version of support uh, for attacks of some sort, particularly if they're more abstract. But, but, but it, it's, so I think what Americans perceive is that these things that President Bush was saying back in 2001 are all well and good, but that what the folks are saying on Fox News today about radical Islam is probably closer to a real picture of what, what Muslims believe about Americans. But, but does history tell us something is different than that? Well, I mean, I think we have to, we're, we're really talking about two different things. We're talking about Islam and we're talking about political Islam. And I think the problem with President Bush coming out and stating uh, uh, categorically that Islam is X or Y or religion of peace, this is really unprecedented. Uh, I mean, there was an exception back after World War II in trying to incorporate the Catholic and Jewish uh, uh, communities into the Protestant mainstream in America, and, and they defined those religions in a certain way. But I would say in the case of Islam, uh, we never really talk about other religions in this way. We do not talk and say that they're religions of peace or religions of war. And the minute that the president puts forward such a proposition, there's going to be someone who contradicts it. And so that is where really the debate is. And my sense is that we would probably not be having this conversation right now had President Bush not announced Islam as a religion of peace. I don't really think that it's the role of the president to define the nature of a particular religion, uh, particularly a religion that he does not belong to. And, uh, uh, and as such, I would say that that's, that's really kind of at the heart of the problem in, in, in terms of how the public discourse is about, about this question. So if we can shift back to political Islam and we can look at political Islamist actors like Al-Qaeda, like the Muslim Brotherhood, these are specific political problems that we can begin thinking about clearly that involve religion, yes, but ones that don't necessarily involve the theology and beliefs of, uh, of a world religion. I would just point out that President Obama is doing the same thing. He is presuming to say what Islam is and isn't. And uh, I think that's consistent with one of the arguments I, I make in the book, that it really isn't up to outsiders. When outsiders say that sort of thing, it, it is taken not in a good way, uh, usually. And this is true across history, the history of these things. Many people since 9-11 and even before have been saying, have been drawing analogies. Um, what's happening in the Muslim world is like the Reformation, Counter-Reformation. The Arab Spring is like the European revolutions of 1848. Um, Richard Haas said last summer, the Middle East is entering its own 30 years war. And there's something to these analogies, but what I'm trying to do is say, well, if we're going to use those analogies, let's get it right. Let's see what the real history is and be very careful not to draw the, long, the wrong lessons and make sure we're drawing the right lessons and, and hedge and realize history doesn't, as Mark Twain supposedly said, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Mm. Well, <laughs> well, so let's, uh, as we do that, let's go back to what Ackerman was saying a moment ago, the, in terms of political Islam versus Islam. So you've written a book that says confronting political Islam, so you must have a good definition of what that is. What do you mean by political Islam? Right, often called Islamism, Islamism, however you want to pronounce it. I take it as a broad ideology that very simply insists that the laws of society, the real laws, positive law, 
be derived directly from Islam's sacred texts, the Quran and the Hadith or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. There are many versions. Islamists are not all on the same page, literally or figuratively speaking. Right. And so I, I sometimes have um, people say, well, there are Islamisms, plural. You shouldn't talk about one single thing. And it um, depends on what level of analysis you're using, but I think it is useful to say broadly from 30,000 feet, there is a, a single phenomenon here that we need to understand. And it's, it's like socialism, communism in Europe in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Lots of different movements. Sometimes they fought each other. Or like Calvinists and Lutherans and Anglicans and Anabaptists 500 years ago. Sometimes they fought each other. Not the Anabaptists, they were fought against. But, but um, same, same thing, but, but we can also talk about a general phenomenon. And Islamism uh, typically defines itself against, let's call it secularism, which originally insists in, both in the West and in the Muslim world, the laws should derive not from sacred texts, but from reason, from experience, from supposedly secular sources. These are ideal types. Uh, most Muslims fall somewhere in between those, those two uh, poles, but it's useful to think about it in, in that way. But so when we, if we try to disconnect, Ahmed, as you were suggesting, if, we, if we're going to try to disconnect politicalism from Islam, then where, where is the Islam in political Islam, and doesn't that Islam apply to this conversation? Well, I mean, the development of political Islam is a very modern phenomenon. I mean, in many ways, it's constructed on ideological models uh, of, of Western thought. Uh, uh, in the, uh, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, began looking at models, in, uh, ideological models in Europe to establish their organization. And so what we really have is a kind of, uh, we can talk about typologies of, of, of political Islam. And, uh, and what they do is they take religion seriously as a way of establishing uh, their, their identity, as a way of countering Western ideologies. Uh, and so, for example, the notion of Sharia is this idealized uh, notion of God's law. They take it very seriously and they say, well, that should be the law and that should repl replace constitutions, for example, that the, the Quran should be the constitution it would be perhaps one phrase. Uh, other aspects is that they have a very idealized notion of historical memory of what the medieval period was like. They think that there was this caliphate that spanned uh, 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 the, the Islamic world from Spain all the way to Indonesia. And the problem with that is uh, that uh, that notion, that idealized notion of history, wasn't there. You had the Islamic world was largely fragmented. There wasn't a single caliph who ruled the entire Islamic world. So in many ways, it is a kind of fiction. It is a fiction that is based on the way they choose to remember Islamic history. So then we talk about Islam in history and also Islam in theology. And, and, and so those currents of the medieval period inform the construction of their modern ideological project. But so the tenets of Islam, though, are still an element of this. But I guess what, what you're telling us is that, that a political Islamist, let's say, if we're talking about an individual, uh, is that someone who is primarily political, uh, is more political than, the, than they are Islamist? Or is that someone who's primarily political and believes a corrupted version of Islam? Is that, is that sort of the suggestion? Well, my, on my view, it's a great question, but it is imposing a certain um, template on, on the question. Uh, as I always do, I'll take this back 500 years in European history, a time before there was separation of church and state. I mean, they were, they were separate in some senses, but they were heavily mingled. So the question of, uh, is this a political or religious movement? If you put that to a Lutheran, uh, in central, the Holy Roman Empire 500 years ago, is this a political or a religious movement? He would say it's both. Of course it's both. Uh, how can it be one and not the other? Um, because the spread of Lutheranism, the retreat of Catholicism, was tied up with the power dynamics of the region. Who's got power? Who's, you know, how are resources distributed? And so traditionally Islam, like traditional, like most of human civilizations, um, didn't have a sharp separation between uh, religion and, and politics. So political Islam uh, hold, holds on to that view. That is, uh, it, it's wrong to say we should separate mosque and state, politics and, and religion. I mean, I, I would simply add that uh, the, uh, 
the, 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 when we're talking about political Islam in this context, you take, for example, jihadi Salafis, right, who emphasize the role of jihad, that is a, a military struggle that took place in early Islam and establishing Islam as an imperium in, in uh, uh, taking over the, the, the former domains of the Sasanian Empire and in the West, the Byzantine Empire. So for them, they want to emphasize this notion of jihad uh, to somehow reconstitute this memory of what Islam uh, was. Uh, so that is a very specific kind of argument about a particular kind of group. This, these groups involve Al-Qaeda, they involve the Islamic State uh, in Syria and Iraq, uh, uh, and, and, and other groups that emphasize violence, right, as a means to achieving their political ends. Now that is a very different conversation than somehow implicating sort of Muslims writ large. One metaphor that I, I find helpful, I don't know if Ahmed will like, like this, let's think of Islam as any great world religion as a, a tree with different branches. And I, I, I think political Islam for, forms some of the branches, but it sh it's not to be confused with the tree as a whole. Neither should we say it has nothing to do with Islam. I think that's just a misguided view. Just as, again, there have been Christian movements, Hindu movements, Jewish movements that uh, are a branch on the tree, but should not be confused with the tree itself. And, and, and I think that makes total sense. Um, and I don't think that anyone suggests that, uh, that because of the things that are happening in Syria and, and uh, Iraq today, that that suggests a specific uh, worldview on the part of, uh, a, of an ordinary Muslim, a member of the faith in Indonesia who, who has no connection to these things. Happily, I, I don't perceive that there's a particularly strong uh, strain of, of a kind of global denunciation of Islam in every variant and every strain. I, I haven't quite heard that, though you begin to hear some of the first glimmers of it, I yeah. think. Um, and the, the things that President Bush was saying back then and that President Obama is saying now, I mean, I think it's notable to the, the sort of conflict. I think you guys have already identified that on the one hand, you're you're sort of objecting to a certain degree to this, um, the, these sort of sweeping definitions of, of Islam by these two non-Muslims, uh, yet they're doing it in, in pursuit of what I think you would want pursued, and that is to, to suggest uh, that there be open-mindedness about and to not make these big assumptions, not to overly connect political Islam or militant Islam or, or, or radical Islam, as some would call it, and the broad faith. But, so it, but it's hard to do that. I, I had a student say to me uh, recently something about, well, we don't call, we didn't call the guy who killed all those people in the movie theater in Boulder, Colorado, a couple of years, we didn't call him a Christian terror, terrorist or a radical American terrorist. We just called him a, a mass murderer. Uh, and, and I said, yes, that's true, and it's a good point, but he also wasn't yelling all praise to God right. uh, while he was killing people, uh, as opposed, and so it's very difficult, I think, to ask uh, anyone to to not perceive a, a violent attack that is being described as in pursuit of a particular faith and the rituals of that faith are being co-opted by it at the very moment that it's happening. Yeah. Very difficult for people to say, okay, that actually isn't about Islam in any way at all. I mean, it, it clearly is in some way, right. as you were just saying. Yeah, it, it is I, I, It is hard for us. I think there, there might be two types of, let me just say, two types of people who say that sort of thing. One is people in, in my own faith, Christianity, who um, look at who've read a bit of the Quran and say look at all the violent language and the things that are depicted there It looks like you can read straight from those texts to what Islamic State is doing. Therefore, it's a bad religion It's it's good trouble um, And the other type it may be and I'll turn this around a little bit uh, You sometimes hear secularists in the West in the United States saying, you know, we have the same problem here, Christian fundamentalists. They're basically with a different book, but they're, they're the same thing. They want to um, impose their laws or their values on, on society, and the law should actually have nothing to do with religion. And what they're doing, they're implying that, in fact, the problem is, is re religion, per se, Islam, be it Islam or Christianity or what have you. And you know, think about how that plays to sophisticated Muslims who hear that, they're, they're might, they might say, I guess the Islamists are right. It's either all or nothing, either complete secularism, which, by the way, most Muslims in the Middle East have said they don't want, according to opinion. They want the, the religion to have some influence over the laws, just not a literal reading the way jihadists and, and so on do. But we have to be careful not to signal to them or to ourselves there's no middle ground here. There's no, it's either no religious influence on public life at all, 
or the religion just takes over. We want to be careful to depict accurately the way we've been working on the religion state problem. Yeah, and you talk in the book about exemplarism and you know, sort of that, right. that one of the approaches to this is just being a good, this might sound patronizing, but role model, but, a, uh, uh, but being a society that lives out its, its, uh, its ostensible principles, and that's one of the arguments of why things went so badly uh, over the last 10 years, yeah. is that some of the conduct of the United States didn't appear to be consistent with our broader uh, cultural values. But, the, but Achman, back, back to this though, in terms of the, how do we separate political Islam from Islam? How do, how do we accomplish what you were sort of suggesting we need to do? I mean, you see the dilemma. Listen, I mean, uh, we're a society that uh, respects freedom of speech, so I think public debate about what Islam is and is not and what, how Muslims define it, I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, I th we should ha be having those kinds of debates and Muslims should be engaging or not engaging as they choose. Uh, the problem is, again, when the president sort of makes a categorical statement, a theological statement about the essence of a religion, what does a policymaker do with a religion of peace or a religion of war? You can't simply construct a thesis, mm -hmm. a, a policy based on a theological notion. And now to shift it back to political Islam, also I think it's problematic when they begin saying, well, let's declare war on Islamism, or as Bush once defined it, Islamofascism, or there are all of these sorts of uh, accretions of, in, uh, in terms of how he tried to define it. The problem there is it unites, it, I don't think that there is a great deal of unity among political Islamists. I think there's, uh, you look at the Islamic State of Iraq fighting against uh, Al-Qaeda, against other groups in, in Syria, Islamist groups. So I think by somehow attributing to them a kind of unifying ideology, first of all, it doesn't say anything about the world. It says more about what we want in terms of finding, finding an ideological foe, perhaps in the wake of communism. Uh, uh, and so I think to clarify the debates, probably it would be less if, the, if, if policymakers spoke less about Islam, and I would even add less about political Islam, and actually try to figure out things uh, in terms of nationalism, in terms of ways that they actually function uh, on the ground as opposed to on the ideological plane. Let me ask you guys, since we've got, to, it's the somewhat rare thing of two uh, people who I think we can believe what you would say in response to these things, but uh, you referred to this a second ago. What does the Quran say about whether it's the duty of Muslims to kill non-believers? So the Quran says a lot of things, including uh, uh, to, to kill uh, certain non-believers, uh, including uh, uh, to fight uh, with, with, with Christians and Jews in certain contexts. Uh, the Quran is scripture. It's scripture like the Hebrew Bible, like the Gospels. It, it contains an entire sort of contradictory world of, 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 uh, of, 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 uh, of, of points about what a believer should do and should not do. It should not be taken as theology as such. Uh, the Quran is what Muslims make it, uh, theologically and otherwise. And so we have to really look at how Muslims make Islam as opposed to somehow this text that stands outside of time and sort of pushes Muslims in a particular direction. So I would say it's scripture like any other scripture and so we have to look at what believers make of it and what political Islamists make of it. And so the answer to the references to those to that kind of language is much like the conversations that many of us have had about Christianity and right. about the Old Testament is that, yeah, sure, it says that over here, but it yep. also says this uh, over there. And there's a compelling argument to, to that that says, no, uh, that, that the line that I heard on Fox News last night, in, in fact, uh, that, the, that the lesson is first we kill the Jews, then the Christians, that, th that kind of language, uh -huh. which is referred to often, um, that that's actually not a mandate of, of Islam to all Muslims. Right. I mean, the, the need for interpretation, I'll just throw that word out there, that, that if you look at the Christian church, you look at Judaism, uh, across time and space, lots of different interpretations uh, that coexist, that mingle and recombine in different ways. Uh, Islam is, is similar, and we shouldn't be surprised that that's the case. There, there are movements, if you like that word fundamentalist, that might be the useful word, that go back to the text and extract direct uh, as if this particular passage is directly telling us, is normative for me right now. Um, all religions have, have those. Uh, at, at various times, some of those movements are extremely powerful. And again, the Islam is suffering under a period when that is a, a powerful uh, tradition. Uh, but it hasn't always been the case and uh, will not always be the case.
And I know these, are, these may seem like uh, sort of simplistic things to bring up to really sophisticated guys like the two of you, but I think that in terms of a broad uh, public discussion about this, that oftentimes we don't go straight at these, these misconceptions uh, um, uh, as directly as we should, but so in a similar sort of vein. So what does the Quran tell us as far as whether, uh, should every young man be looking for his opportunity to participate in jihad and, and to become a martyr? What really is the message that a young Muslim in that part of the world receives from, from his faith or, or that, that many might, might likely receive? What, what does it say about jihad? Well, I mean, uh, jihad uh, is an obligation to defend the realms of Islam, Islam's medieval imperium. Uh, it was a duty that the caliph would uh, call the Muslims to do. Uh, and uh, it was an attempt to uh, uh, define a certain territory where Islamic law was practiced. Um, that's roughly the definition, and often in legal manuals, uh, you will see there discussions of the rights of combatants, non-combatants, uh, perhaps there's even a theory of just war there. Uh, 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 so it is a complex uh, legal question of what jihad is. Now what modern day Salafi jihadists make of it and how they define it, well, that's, that's actually really the problem. Uh, it's not so much uh, Islam historically, it's actually how Islam is conceived of and construed within the modern period and how jihad is defined and redefined. So one of the debates that some uh, uh, modern Muslims will make is that jihad is a spiritual struggle uh, and that uh, uh, that is really what it is intended to be. Yes, it is that, but it is also historically, as we know, a military struggle. So you have different interpretations of what jihad is. What about this? This may seem totally trite, but, uh, but it, it has been such a consistent element of, the, uh, of our trying to figure out what was happening over the last 10 or 20 years in the mm -hmm. struggle. But the whole notion that if you, if you are of this vein of Islam, where you, uh, you see the importance of participating in jihad as a physical struggle, and you go uh, and try to be a part of the fighting, or if you're a Western Muslim who's trying to get to Syria now and become part of the fighting, this idea that becoming a martyr uh, is something that uh, is, is encouraged by the faith and that all sorts of wonderful things like 50 virgins or by another interpretation, 50 white raisins, I believe has been, or that may have actually or been, 70, what, yeah, or 70, there we are. The, but, but I mean, what, what, again, what is the message to a, uh, to, to a young Muslim as, as far as once you have embarked into this part of Islam, uh, what is the message of, of why you should do this and what will happen if you become a martyr, if you participate in jihad? Well, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that you have a, a large number of European Muslims uh, and also, I should add, uh, European converts to Islam going and fighting in Syria and other places, uh, part of it is that uh, they see the ideology of the Islamic State of Iraq as something uh, as being robust, and and that's something that appeals to them, uh, and that may uh, uh, talk about some sort of uh, uh, lack of robustness in ideological terms within their own states, and so this becomes appealing. Uh, there is also this kind of utopian notion of what the Islamic State represents. It represents this harking back to the caliphate, this reestablishment of an Islamic imperium, and to be part of that is very exciting for some uh, young Muslims and converts to Islam. So uh, really what we're talking about is a kind of idealism uh, that, that they have and that they feel that they can fulfill by going and, and carrying out their duty of jihad there. It's a simple narrative, right? And if you are looking for salvation and you're looking for some sort of, some sort of ideological, idealistic fulfillment, yes, you go there and you, you engage in jihad and uh, you, you carry out certain precepts of Islam and that's it. Uh, so that message, I think, appeals to, it's a modern message. It's the message of the individual and the religion and the text and you simply read it and then you enact it as opposed to the complexities of tradition and authority and all of these things. So many of these young, uh, young uh, men and women are bypassing all of that and simply uh, are going out there as individuals to sort of fulfill what they believe is uh, uh, their duty uh, religiously. And in this, uh, going back to Western history, it's, it's a lot like some of the radical movements we've seen in Western history. Uh, anarchists, uh, 100 years ago, look back, look at this up on Wikipedia, lots of anarchist assassinations, including William McKinley. Um, 
This was a powerful movement, not as mass as political Islam, but it attracted a lot of young people who were alienated from their own societies. Bolshevism, the same thing. Lenin and, and the group were heavily alienated from Russian society, and they found and helped generate, create, and spread this radical movement with a simple narrative, a simple set of solutions, black and white, very clear what we need to do. Uh, and as I said, they, they succeeded in large part for a number of decades. Yeah, and I, I think you know, we all have a lot of experience in the United States with uh, misappropriation of historical narratives, whether they're religious or, or political, and this oversimplification of these glorious times. I mean, the, the, the whole over-reverence for the Founding Fathers um, uh, is probably in that category uh, in American life today, in both a religious and a non-religious way, you know, mm. that, that somehow, and, uh, and, and not, not really wanting to reconcile the stark contradictions between the political or religious views of some of our uh, primal figures in American life with right. their actual personal conduct. And so, yeah, th these contradictions yeah. are very human. The, it's interesting, though, in the book, you do a really nice job of introducing uh, a different idea from the one we had generally heard a good bit about already. I mean, it, in conversations of the what is this conflict or this clash of civilizations, as some would call it, between uh, the world of, Muslim, of, of Islam and, and the West, we heard a lot about the, well, the Crusades were, were the, you know, we, we were doing to them what they're doing yeah. to us in the Crusades. We sort of heard that, uh, which is not an unreasonable position. Uh, but you also bring into it this more internal struggle of Christianity in the 16th century, and then that, that translates over into, the, into North America as well. I mean, right. the struggles between the colonies. But walk through some of that and why, what exactly it is in some detail about the, the, the Calvinists versus the Lutherans and the Huguenots and the Catholics and, uh, and how those things give us some sort of an insight into what's happening in Islam now. In the Catholic uh, mind, there was a, a single phenomenon, Protestantism, that was a mistake. And so um, we, you know, people in secular societies tend to think we do the same thing with Islam. It's this monolithic thing and it's the divisions don't really matter ultimately. So I see very similar discourse in the way people talk about Islamism now and the way our ancestors talked about the Reformation, Counter-Reformation divisions. Um, some other really concrete similarities, and I'll broaden this beyond just the Reformation, bring it up into the 18th and 19th century struggles among Republicans and monarchists, 20th century fascism, communism, and uh, liberal democracy. You see in all of these struggles transnational networks of ideologues that communicate uh, across national borders. They send each other money, advice, literature, sermons, um, and they agitate for revolution in their countries. They cheer each other on. They often have to go underground. Well, we saw something similar when the Saudis led a, an invasion of Bahrain um, right at the heart of the Arab Spring to put down a revolution. They were quite worried about. Bahrain is a majority Shia country that Iran considers one of its lost provinces. Uh, the Saudis see it very differently. Uh, Bahrain is ruled by a, a Sunni uh, royal family, so the Saudis went and helped the royal family, which is on their side of the Islamist struggle against the Shias. Very, very similar to things you see throughout the history of these sorts of struggles. But so what does that tell us about where things go now in terms of Islam itself or the many Islams uh, or our relationship with it? I mean, is that telling us that things are going to be better in 400 years? <laughs> yeah. No, good, yeah, good question. I, uh, I mean, one, I think one mistake we have made in this country is to have too much certainty about how this is going to end and, and our ability to, to end it, actually. I mean, think about President Bush's second inaugural where he said it is the goal of the United States to end tyranny in the modern world. I mean, that's a very radical thing to say. There's a whole tradition of realism, we call it, in international relations, that says that, that's not going to happen. You know, don't, so, and if you try to make it happen, you, you might make things worse. But a lot of Americans resonate with that language. It's part of our tradition to say, yeah, that's, that's what we're about. We, we end tyranny. That's our, our business. Um, so the, one of the lessons of history is these, these things actually can't be settled even by a superpower. And, an, and, and another disadvantage for the United States is we're an outsider uh, to this one. I argue in the book we can't withdraw. I'm not, I, I think there are many, many reasons why the United States can't simply say we're, we're finished with the Middle East, we're, we're leaving. Even though we created, we, the West, we created the boundaries that are being argued over now, but we can't the national, walk away from them. Yeah, the yeah, national, the national bound, right, yeah. But I, I, I think that's part of the reason why we, we can't 
just uh, walk away. And there are other, other interests that aren't even germane here, you know, strategic interests, energy interests, and so on, and I don't mean to, you know, we can't dismiss those. Um, but it's one thing to say we remain engaged and cooperate with actors who, um, who have solutions, who are working towards solutions rather than destruction. Um, it's another thing to say we can just come in and solve this with, with money or with, with weapons. Uh, we hopefully learned a, a big lesson in the last decade about, about that. And I want to stress it's not just, oh, we can't shoot our way out of this problem. Um, money also, even rhetoric, diplomacy, these, these are things, because the United States is a Western, perceived as an outside power that's colonialist and just trying to use this to its own ends and it doesn't care about Muslims, um, we, we have to handle, handle with care. So it is a, uh, a kind of a nuanced conclusion. We can't withdraw, but we can't fix it either. Immediately after 9-11, the, at the time I was an editor at the Wall Street Journal, and I was one of the editors who was tasked on the, the day after 9-11, we set out immediately to try to uh, run down who were the hijackers because you know, the names were immediately available. Um, and the, and the, one of the amazing things about the reach of an organization like the Wall Street Journal then was that uh, we had a reporter at the home of Mohammed Atta's father wow. within 24 hours. We were, we were at Mohammed Atta's front door, one of the, one of the organizers of the attacks in, in the U.S., uh, and, and did a long interview with Mohammed Atta's father at the time. But Mohammed Atta's father, A, um, denied that his son had had any involvement and insisted for several years that his son was still alive somewhere and was, uh, was hiding. I mean, this was a kind of classic middle-class family with pretty classic middle-class problems, but you end up with a, a son who then goes off and does, is a part of this horrible, horrible thing, but then a father who is both to the time of his death, several years later, uh, unable to either accept that his son was a part of it or really to say this was explicitly a terrible thing that happened and continue to say things like maybe that shouldn't have been done, but America probably needed to learn a lesson. And of course, the, the, the biggest irony of that to me is that in all the polling that's done among Muslims around the world, it's almost always the case that the United States is the place where, uh, where Muslims are least likely to say they feel threatened or disrespected by the larger non-Muslim society. I mean, the polling for the U.S. is always good. So the great Satan is actually the best place to live uh, if, if, you're, if you're a Muslim. I mean, part of the views that Muhammad Atta's father held uh, have a basis in history. I mean, they have a basis in terms of how some Muslims see the colonial project of dividing the Middle East. Uh, uh, they have a basis uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, how the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, is, is carried out. Uh, they have some basis, whether it's completely factual or not, is a, is it can be contested. So the question is, people can hold these kinds of views. The, 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 uh, I doesn't, it's really inconsequential whether they hold these views or not. The question is, what triggers them actually to join these groups? That's actually where I think the debate should be, whether people are, uh, hold conspiracy theories. I mean, you know, you can go uh, out into America and think, you know, uh, the, 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 the CIA or the FBI uh, uh, assassinated uh, Kennedy. Sure, a lot of people hold these kinds of views. Uh, I don't really think these views are really of uh, any particular interest. They're, they're there. They may represent a kind of antagonism towards the U.S., uh, 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 but at the same time, really what the issue is, how do you, be, how, does, how, is, how is someone who holds these views then triggered to join these or groups? Or the opposite. Is, is it possible, what John was just suggesting, that is Mohammed Atta's sister, who is not a radical but who, uh, and, and who actually won't talk, do interviews anymore, uh, but is it, as John was suggesting a minute ago, is it possible somehow to identify that person or what she represents in, in that society and make an alliance that fortifies her against, even if it's not a, an explicit alliance, but is there some way that a person who's not a radical becomes a bridge to a... I, listen, I think one of the big problems is that this seems to be largely a struggle between political Islamists, however defined, uh, and governments. Governments putting out this narrative of Islam as a religion of peace, putting out counter-ideological narratives, and in effect thinking that they're in an ideological struggle. 
with the Islamists, that if somehow, that, that, that possibly somehow ISIS is going to expand and, and nation states are going to collapse and you're going, this is not going to happen. Uh, ISIS is not going to expand to the point where nation states began collapsing. In fact, it seems to be going against them now. Uh, so I think if the government, if governments, and, and I include even uh, uh, governments in the Islamic world, de-emphasize this notion of an ideological struggle and simply leave that to be a struggle between clerics and others and a kind of popular sort of societal sort of question, then I think that de-emphasizes the strength of these groups and people are less likely to join them because as we know, any time a government sort of takes a position, it's not exactly the first thing that you want to believe. Do you agree with that, John? Well, I do wonder, I, I'm not sure I agree because if, uh, opinion polls show that most Arabs want Islam to have some influence on the laws, they are not radical jihadis at all. They also want democracy. And this idea of Islamic democracy uh, could take any number of forms. It's being, maybe, maybe Tunisia is a, emerging as a success, success story. But public opinion, if, if countries become democratic, will matter. And I think, I think the um, uh, you know, attitudes toward coming to terms with the history and with the current situation with Israel and so on is important insofar as these countries become more and more democratic. I think this is on the minds of a lot of Americans as they think about democracy in the region. So that's um, uh, one question. Now regarding governments and their ability or, or whether they should just withdraw and let civil society argue this out. Uh, 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 that, that's how I interpreted what you were saying. That's correct. All right, I would, I would like to think that would work and it would be neat and it, uh, you're, you're right, government is not perceived as a neutral actor. It is not a referee, it is a participant in, in the ideological wars and it can't opt out of that and say, right, we're, we're just uh, the referee. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do wonder though if under current conditions, if things just play out in civil society, how will they come out? I, I don't, I guess it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a factual question. How robust are the uh, seminaries and the mosques and the networks that reject and explicitly reject these violent movements. How much um, purchase are they getting over public opinion in these countries? Uh, I, I think the governments uh, th worry about this. That's why they're intervening. They think if we, let, if we let the marketplace of ideas fight this out, it may come out the wrong way, and that's why they're intervening. So for me, it's really, a factual question, how robust are these uh, alternative networks? Well, I mean, I don't mean to suggest that uh, if we pull out in, from the ideological fight that somehow we stop fighting these groups on the ground, that we mm -hmm. no longer designate them as terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. no, I, no, absolutely not. I think that battle has to continue in one form or another, and it has to continue both with partners in the Middle East and other places. But that battle is a military battle. Mm -hmm. It is won over geography and space as opposed to ideology. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, that ideological struggle is, is something that has to be worked out there internally. It's not something that we can push directly and publicly. And again, not to say that you can't uh, engage these groups militarily. That's right, a different right, sort of right. thing. I think I'm still struggling with this, um, <laughs> with, with how we separate um, the, the sort of the military struggle from the ideological one. It seems yeah. to me that that's, a, that's a difficult to make as complete a break as, as, as you would suggest. Well, I mean, my sense is that uh, this, we have been engaged in an ideological struggle. I mean, in fact, Bush created this notion. He transferred this notion of a civilizational class, the Huntington thesis, into a clash of ideologies, right? And, and so, where has that gotten us in, in terms of public opinion in the, in the Islamic world? Mm -hmm. And every year we spend more and more to try to communicate to the Islamic world to think that they should love us. I mean, as if, uh, you know, uh, uh, the United States had some sort of record before 9-11 that they were loved and then all of a sudden, it, you know, th th this is a problematic notion for a government to seek love from Muslims in general, this very abstract notion of, of a religious people. Uh, and so I don't think it really has gotten us anywhere. And my sense is continue in terms of the military struggle, in terms of helping Iraq reconstitute itself as a nation state, in terms of territory, but leave that ideological struggle uh, uh, for others to do. Well, we've only got a few minutes left, but there are a couple of things, other things I do want to touch on. And one, this goes back to another kind of discussion we've heard before, but I, I'm interested in hearing the two of you talk about it just for a moment. And that is that, 
uh, the question of whether there has been an Islamic reformation and sort of where that all or fits into this. Another way of looking at that is to say, and you mentioned heresy a few minutes ago when you were talking about Christians, yeah. but the, so much of this seems to boil down to on the ideological side, but that plays into the political uh, version of it, a question of whether heretics can be accepted in a particular civilization or not. And Christianity went through this this tremendous upheaval that was really all about heresy and who were the heretics and what was going to happen to the heretics and killing each other because you thought each other were heretics and then finally arriving at a place where societies decided we can tolerate heresy within our midst and heretics at least to some degree and now we live in a overwhelmingly her heretical society probably <laughs> uh, but heresy also allowed us to pursue at least by the conventional telling science and all sorts of other things yeah. that led to great advances in other realms because we could accept some, what seemed like heresy. The problem with Charlie Hebdo was that these heretical uh, expressions e even in Paris. And so, and without an acceptance of heresy, you cannot pursue all sorts mm -hmm. of other complicated and difficult ideas in a civilization. Is that really what this is? Is that an oversimplification of how it boils down to heresy and ultimately whether Islam, the many Islams, can can be faiths that allow for heresy and then can engage with another civilization or civilizations that already allow heresy? I can go first go with, with my. Uh, yeah, uh, heresy and apostasy too, which is leaving the religion. That's also highly problematic and illegal in, 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 some, in some kind. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> not just laughs, apostate. Um, going back one more time to the Reformation period, there was a medieval uh, commonly held understanding in Europe that um, religion is the bond of society. It's not enough to have a king or a duke who has coercive power it's not enough even to have an integrated economy. You have to have, everyone has to hold to the common religion. And in the Reformation, and certainly in the early decades, Catholics and Protestants accepted that view. So what, what happened there was this detachment of the notion of uh, the growth or contraction of a religion from political power. It became separate. So a particular religion could grow now on your doorstep that what wouldn't threaten your established regime. And it took a lot, a long time, a lot of thinking and talking and fighting and dying for that, that to happen. Now, Europeans remained religious after this happened. It's not as though they abandoned the idea of heresy. They still thought, you know, Calvinists thought the Armenians were heretics and vice versa. It's just they stopped associating heresy with threats to their own position, their own political power, their uh, money, and, and so on. It became a, a separate realm uh, for, for the most part. And... So yeah, I, I, I don't want to say, oh, I, I'm trying to be careful not to say the Muslims need to learn from the West and what we went through. If they would just imitate us, it would be fine. That's, that's not the message. It is that at this particular time and place in history, some changes happened that did yield a lot of benefits that more or less everybody would recognize. And there are Muslims who like that and would like something like that in their part of the, there are others right now who really don't want that and they're, they're fighting to, to stop it. Um, but it can happen, historically it has happened in, uh, in the West and it can happen in other places as well. I mean, you take a country like Bahrain was about 80% Shiite, uh, ruled by a small majority of Sunnis. Um, it's a fairly stable place. It seems to have worked out in one form or another, but it's inherently problematic in terms of the egalitarian notion of citizenship and, and other things, uh, distribution of wealth. So uh, I think it's a problem that's going to uh, remain with us, I think, for quite some time, uh, the, the, the sectarian divide. And then on the other hand, there is the question of how groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State of Iraq justify the killing of other Muslims, and that is the question of apostasy. And so for them, they view all of these nation states, all of these secular constitutional laws as effectively infidel laws. And so for them, those who associate uh, uh, with those states and who follow the orders of those governments and participate in their militaries, well, they're infidels. And so they, uh, according to them, should be slaughtered. What's the one thing, one, that we either ought to or ought not to do? Leave us with that. The United States has always been thought of itself as exemplifying uh, constitutional order, republicanism, liberalism, democracy, and so on, uh, tolerance. Um, after 9-11, there are lots of, um, we were in a sense on a war footing in the way we handled jihadism. Uh, 
Uh, Guantanamo Bay prison is still open. It's not, obviously not easy to close it or President Obama and President Bush would have, would have done it. So it's easy for me to say close it. Um, but I think we need to focus on this as a symbol of the type of regime we have because Muslims pay a, are paying a lot of attention to this. Um, and that's tied up in the questions of, of, of torture, you know, enhanced interrogation techniques, um, black sites, and, and all sorts of things. The world is paying attention, even now. And second, another thing I mentioned earlier, the way we talk about religion and secularism in this country, uh, the world is watching that as well. Our societies need to work this out and show that we are not hostile toward religious faith and practice. Um, but we do work out the relationship between religion and state differently, and it, it works. And um, religious believers thrive in this country. Well, let's hope we can uh, make whatever the leap is that we're after in less than 400 years. But yes, indeed. thank you both for being here. <laughs> to view this program and other episodes and for more about John Owen's Confronting Political Islam and both our guests, visit us at millercenter.org, American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next time. Thanks.